I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is Warren Irwin, President of Rosso Asset Management. Thank you so much for joining me today. Great to see you. Great to see you too, Charlotte. Yeah, really nice to be talking with you. And since it is our first time speaking, I wondered if you could start by giving me a quick overview of what you do right now at your company and also your background in the uranium space, because that's mostly what we're going to focus on today. Yeah, uh, what we do at our company, we're um, probably the the oldest um, resource hedge fund in Canada. We're, we've been around for 25 years. I don't know if anybody has been around longer, but there might be somebody. Um, so we manage uh, uh, we manage money generally in the higher risk category in the in the early stage um, resource side. So we touch on all the different commodities, including uranium. And uh, my background on uranium is I was active in the last cycle. I was an investor. Probably my biggest win back then was uh, extract uranium. And we sold that to the Chinese uh, back the last cycle. And this cycle, um, I would think I've probably made more money than most people. Uh, just under $100 million we made on NextGen over the past seven years since NextGen made their discovery in the Athabasca Basin. And um, that's been our big win in the uranium space. So I've been very active in it the past seven years. So, you know, you mentioned the cycle that we're in right now. Yeah. Just to situate everybody, where do you see us as being in, in the current cycle? Well, what's interesting is uh, I was in this actual building here when I met Al Gore about four years ago at the TED conference, and he was, he was espousing the benefits of solar and wind, and I knew that it was complete nonsense. You can't run factories on solar and wind, and we've dammed up all our rivers, and I knew that nuclear was the only answer, so I asked him, I said, what do you think about nuclear energy? How come it's not one of your renewables? And he kind of looked as if I had five heads and uh, walked away. So uh, nuclear energy has come a ways, even the last three or four years, from a, a pariah to people have finally figured out the mathematics behind it that we cannot survive without non-CO2 generating baseload, which uranium is one of the few remaining options we have other than hydro. We've already dammed up all our rivers and in the future, we may have fun things like fusion or something like that. But for now, it's it's uh, uranium with uh, nuclear reactors. Okay, so you know one of the reasons I wanted to bring you here today to talk about uranium, you're going to be speaking about it at this conference for at VRIC. But from watching some of your other interviews, I know you have kind of a different take on many of the other people that we hear from on the market. So if you could just give me kind of a, a quick look at you know where you see supply and demand and how it might be kind of different. Yeah, where my view differs from a lot of people is we got a lot of people super excited about demand. Well, everybody knows that nuclear is the answer. Well, I knew nuclear was the answer seven years ago, 10 years ago, the last cycle. So, okay, so nuclear is the answer, all right? The only problem is on the demand side, we have an install base of 450 nuclear reactors. So if there's 50 in under construction, which is a rumor when you include all the ones in China mostly, um, let's say those, those 50 reactors come in over the next five years. The math is there's 10 a year, which works out to about a 2% increase in demand every year. And there'll be some restarts out of Fukushima, but then over time, there, there'll also be some closings over, over the next little while. So we're talking low, low single digit growth in demand. That's reality. Nobody can change that. You can't, when's the last time you've seen one permitted in your backyard and built? takes a while for permitting. Nobody wants them in their backyards. It takes years to build them. So demand is not going to spike up like we've seen with some of the other battery metals because um, it's just not that fast. So speaking a little bit more about demand, you know, it seemed like this past winter when we had all these energy crisis in Europe, concerns going around, people got, I don't want to say excited about that, but you know, more attention was being paid to what is the role of nuclear. And it, it seemed like everybody thought that would really spark, you know, government assistance. Maybe they're going to speed up these these reactor times. Any any thoughts on that area? Uh, have we seen it? I know that uh, Ontario uh, has, um, they're moving forward with, I think, a, a small modular reactor. And I think the U.S. is also, so that we're talking one small modular reactor for the Canada, one small modular reactor for the U.S. Whoopie-doo, what's that going to do to demand for uranium, right? Right, right. And so on the supply side, let's talk about that yeah. as well, because, 
you know, we've had years and years of low prices, although they started to move. Yeah. Um, thoughts on supply? Yeah, supply, you know, this is an issue I've been, uh, like I said, I was involved in the last cycle, and then over the past seven years, I've been actively involved with, with watching the, the, the price of uranium because of my investment with NextGen. So I've talked to a lot of really smart people, and I've tried to get, get to the bottom of uranium pricing. And uh, frankly, uh, if, if it confounds people about the pricing of uranium, you know, it confounds a lot of people, right? Because I, I spoke with a senior executive the other day and he was saying, Warren, I can't believe uranium is only at 50 bucks. And I'm going, yeah, I can't believe it either. I remember seven years ago expecting a, a big rally back in uranium. And, you know, it, I think when I started, it was around 20, 25 bucks or 30 bucks. And then it dropped to 17. Now it's back up to 50. And one would have expected some level of excitement going from $17 to $50 in the price of uranium. But I'll tell you, uh, you know, we have not seen the, the super level of excitement, certainly in the price of the juniors, that I would have expected with the tripling of the commodity price. Right, and so with supplies, so we've got the uranium out there, right? Does it then depend on the price level to incentivize it to come back online? for new projects to start up and you know maybe we can talk a bit about the levels yeah. that we need to see. Well you've nailed it Charlotte because the price of uranium I've explained how the demand side is not growing as fast as anybody thinks right so um, on the supply side I remember seven years ago speaking one of the smartest guys I know in the uranium space he goes Warren you're an idiot to be excited about uranium I said why is that he says I know of a billion pounds of uranium sitting on the sidelines ready to hit the market well Looking back, okay, at that pro projection that my friend said, which is just one person's view in the market, so, you know. Um, but in the last seven years, there's been a supply deficit of, let's say, 40 to 50 million pounds. You've probably heard this. There's 180 million pounds of demand. Supply coming out of the mine, mines is about 130. So there's about a 50 million pound per year deficit to be made up. But it's been made up for seven years we found this 50 million pounds a year for seven years. That's 350 million pounds of uranium out of nowhere that's hit the market. And I keep trying to find out where this uranium is coming from. It's all cloak and dagger, special sources, government stockpiles here that nobody knows where it comes from, but it seems to have every year, 40 to 50 million pounds arrives on the market. And then you have, in addition to that, you had Sprott Uranium Trust and Yellow Cake take another 70 million pounds out of the market. So that's a total of 420 million pounds in the last seven years that have hit the market and nobody knows where it's come from. So you, you compare that to, again, the very slow demand side and you're going, it's all, it's all a supply-based situation. And so that's what's kind of interesting. And then on the supply, people say, well, we're gonna run out of uranium. And we're not gonna run out of uranium. Trust me on that one. I have been, in the last two months, I've seen over projects with drilled out resources of well over a billion pounds of uranium. Ready to go into market. As soon as the prices get a little bit higher, we're ready to put these into production. But like I said, the demand's not there. And the only reason we'll need those extra pounds is if the secondary supply dries up and nobody knows where it's coming from and nobody knows when it'll dry up and then Anyways, we could, we could go on about mine production too. Well, yeah, I know, and I think what people might say to you about, you know, okay, all of the supply has come out of the ward work in recent years to, to satisfy demand, but it seems like what I hear from people is, wow, but it's now it's now it's dried up. Like, this is definitely this the This is end. definitely the time. So, it's dried up for sure this time. <laughs> yeah. So any any more comments? Maybe we can talk a little bit about that because it is very opaque and this is kind of the it problem is, yeah. with uranium. So It is. Well, okay, so the supply is dried up. Well, guess what else is happening? Well, the Kazakhstans are cranking their production back up because they took, a, I believe, a, a one point of 20 percent. Now I think they're down 10 percent supply cut and they'll be going back to production. I've spoken with the former president of Kazataprom, and he said, Warren, you know, you give me a hundred million bucks, we'll crank up another X millions of pounds of uranium. It'll take within a year. The Kazakhs have excess supply, ability to supply the market, quite a bit more uranium than they're supplying, right? Then you take a look at Cameco. What's Cameco doing? Well, they're, they've had two mines shut down. That didn't seem to do too much for the price of uranium. Now they're opening them back up again. Well, is that going to help or hurt? 
you're going to have MacArthur River coming back on stream, and then you're going to have Cigar Lake coming back on stream. And then the big daddy of them all, next gen, that's 30 million pounds coming on stream. They're probably a year and a half, two years from permit. Then they'll build. So in, let's say, six years, we're going to have another 30 million pounds hitting a market where demand is 180 million pounds. That's pretty significant. So in addition to that, Warren has been shown over a billion pounds of additional drilled out resources ready to hit the market as soon as the price gets high enough to uh, put it into production. So there's no shortage of uranium and demand's not growing. So what could, what could screw up my prognostications here? And just, I'm not gonna say I'm right. There are a lot of people ahead of me and before me, smarter than me with more experience in the uranium market than me have been proven wrong on this. But those are just some numbers. But if, if you look at the future, the um, one, what they're trying to do here, let's say take a look at Sprott Uranium Trust, right? The market, the spot market especially, can be quite illiquid. So how I could be proven wrong is some big hedge fund guy out of the U.S. with the $30 billion hedge funds throws a few billion dollars at Sprott Uranium Trust or Yellow Cake or, or decides to even buy the uranium on the spot market themselves, ramp up the price of uranium to 120 bucks a pound, all the juniors run, and then that big hedge fund sells all the juniors into the market back at unsuspecting investors thinking that 120 is actually justified. And um, there you have it. That's, that's pretty much what happened last time. Speculators ran the price of uranium up to crazy levels. And we went from having like, you know, a dozen or so juniors to having hundreds and hundreds of juniors that everybody lost all their money on. So that's the scenario you don't expect. That's the if you're wrong scenario. In your expectation, I guess, then what, what level could we see from prices this time around? What's, what's reasonable? Without some heavy involvement of massive speculators trying to manipulate the market, I would expect, it wouldn't be unreasonable to expect, you know, prices to gradually move higher over time. We're seeing not only price pressures on, we're seeing price pressures in terms of how much it costs to, to produce uranium, like mining costs, costs of those yellow trucks you see out there, they're getting more expensive. Diesel fuel is more expensive. Labor is more expensive. Takes longer to permit. Permitting is more expensive. And all those things will, will, will lead to a gradual increase in the price over time. And uh, then you have a gradual demand. And again, the thing that could really screw that projection up would be if for some reason there was the massive seller out there, if it is one or two or whatever decides not to sell. So you never know. So that's, that's the big the big unknown in the uranium market. But one thing for sure, there's enough uranium out there. If prices get much, get, get significantly higher, there's enough out there that could be put into production to satisfy any, any gap in so the supply demand uh, equation. All right, and okay, so to go on a little bit of a tangent, but not too much of a tangent, thoughts on enrichment and conversion. It kind of seemed like last year when we had the Russia-Ukraine war, everybody suddenly realized, hey, most of that is not happening over here in North America. It's going on yeah. in Russia. So how does that play into the equation? Does that have any bearing on, on your thoughts on the market? You know, you could take, the, when you're looking at the price of uranium, you could go into the absolute minutia of everything, uh, whether it be uh, overfeeding, underfeeding, enrichment capacity, or the countries of enrichment capacity, the, you know, the fact that the U.S. wants to have domestic supply when, you know, that's a fallacy because... There's not a lot of uranium in the U.S. compared to, let's say, or they haven't found enough uranium in U.S. versus Canada. So you could really get into the nitty gritty if you want. I think a lot of that, for me anyways, is just noise because I know where there's over a billion pounds of uranium that's ready to come on stream anytime. It just needs a bit of time, right? It just takes time. Um, but if, if, um, if we get these short-term spikes in prices due to speculative um, forces, it could play, play havoc with that. But long-term, we have lots of uranium. Long-term, the uranium demand, it can't grow super duper fast. We'll be able to grow mine supply as fast as the demand will grow. So everything will be fine in uranium land, but definitely there's a massive body of people trying to ramp the price of uranium. They're trying their best and they've been trying for years to do it. Who knows, maybe they'll be successful this time, but if they do do it, please sell into it because 
there's lots of uranium that'll come on board over time that'll satisfy all the demand we need. Yeah, and maybe we can talk a little bit then about strategies for investors because there is, there's enthusiasm about this. It sounds like, I mean, there are ways to make it work. So any thoughts there? Yeah. In the 25 years I've run Rosso Asset Management, we've made, you know, we made a bunch of money in this space. We're one of the few surviving survivors. And as you know, it's tough to survive in this market. So we survived. That's a big, that's a big, you know. <laughs> so the lesson I've learned from that is, Warren, don't waste your time worrying about the price of a stupid commodity, whether it goes up or down or whatever else. The bigger, the bigger alpha, the bigger area you could really add value investing is buying good companies in any sector. I've bought good gold companies in a falling gold market and I've made a ton of money. And I've bought, you know, so that's really the key is you look at individual companies and the advice I'd give somebody who for whatever reason wants to be in the uranium space, find a good uranium company that will uh, grow their resource and become a better company every year even if the price of uranium drops to 40 bucks or hangs around the 50 level for the next little while and you'll be fine but uh, people who want to buy the junky really junky stuff that is like they're, and they're being they're being created today by I'm not saying scammers but people who around the last cycle who saw the amount of money made on a lot of junky uranium companies those junky uranium companies right now are being created and being revved up, ready for the next big uranium boom, and they're junk. They'll never be in production ever. And what's gonna happen as soon as the price runs up, there'll be a lot of people behind those companies selling into it. And just make sure you're not the one buying those junky uranium companies on the hype of the uranium market. Stick with good quality names, and that would do well in, any, in the current environment. You'll be fine. And I guess to get a little more specific, is there a particular stage that you would look at right now? You mentioned companies that are going to grow from year to year, but could you look right now at a junior? Would you go more for that development stage or even minors? Well, it depends on each person's different risk profile. Like right now, if you want a, if you want a reasonably uh, blue chip one, you know, next gen, it has one of the finest mineral discoveries in the entire world. It's not, uh, it's not running up like super crazy expensive, but it, it's going through a permitting time and people are bored. It's going permitting, so it's not as if the price is on fire. It's going through a permitting. So if you can sit there and wait a couple of years for it to go through permitting and then get built and then uh, build the mine, get the cash flow, that's the most conservative one. Um, that's too conservative for me now, so I'm gradually moving out of next gen. Um, the sweet spot, I think, for most investors is following some initial good results on the discovery front. So you can see that, okay, this could, be, this could be something. That's where I find the sweet spot is. And then, of course, the super high risk strategy is just backing these guys with these greenfield exploration projects, which there's lots of them out there for sure, for sure right now. They're all looking for your money. And they'll start from scratch. But even those, it takes many years to go from a greenfield project to even any level of discovery, uh, unless they're very, very lucky. Yeah, nothing really happens quickly. I think hopefully we all know that by this time in mining. Yeah. Um, so it was great to get your thoughts on everything uranium. I think that's gonna be very enlightening for people who are looking at the market right now, wondering where it's gonna go. As we're finishing up, I wonder if there are any other commodities that you might be excited about bullish on in 2023. Yeah, as I said, well, where I make my money is not necessarily choosing the commodity and finding the company. I find the best companies who just happen to be in this commodity. So right now I'm involved in, um, involved in a copper play that um, is, I believe, quite cheap and hopefully will get sold here this cycle. I'm involved in metallurgical coal. Talk about a Talk about a sector that is completely out of favor. Again, the people who don't know anything about the mining sector are lumping in metallurgical coal with thermal coal, saying they're all bad, but guess what? Your stupid Tesla needs steel, and that steel needs met coal. And without met coal, you can't build your Tesla. You can't build your electrical infrastructure. You can't build your nuclear power plants. You can't build your, your, um, your wind farms or your solar panels without metallurgical coal. 
but metallurgical coal, for whatever reason, is completely out of favor. Okay, well, that's, that's a, a really good sign. That's a bit of a, a market inefficiency. I'm also involved in um, one of my favorite commodities. Uh, uh, I managed to find a really good project in, uh, in uh, nickel sulfide, which is something very difficult to find. And nickel is used in obviously stainless steel and some of the battery, battery metals. Okay, well maybe, hopefully if we have you back, we can go into some of those other topics. But it was great to have you here right now and, and hone in on uranium. Thank you, Charlotte, for having me. And um, we'll, we'll see what happens with the uranium market. It'll definitely be interesting. I think so. Thank All you. Right. So once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network. And this is Forum Irwin with Russell Asset Manager.